Hello and welcome to UPL Insights, a digital media series from UPL, led by our friends, colleagues and experts across the world. UPL Insights brings together leaders in sustainable farming, food systems and climate resilience to explore the challenges and developments defining the agricultural sector today. Join us each month as we talk to some of the people leading our food system transformation inside and outside of UPL and exploring new and existing priorities alongside our shared commitment to resilience, trade, nourishment and sustainable productivity. Today, I am joined by Paula Pinto, who is Global Head of Business and Marketing Excellence for UPL Limited. Paula is responsible for driving cross-company strategic initiatives. And earlier this year, Paula initiated the UPL Women's Network to drive greater visibility and opportunities for women across UPL's global footprint. And joining Paula from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization is Francesca Di Stefano, a gender and policy expert who has contributed to much of FAO's national policy development for gender in agriculture, including in Botswana, Tanzania, and Rwanda. Francesca is currently part of the FAO team, leading efforts in the Africa region to empower rural women and foster gender equality in the agricultural sector. So the topic of today, as you may have imagined, is women, women in agriculture. Actually, women are the backbone of agriculture, with studies suggesting that they account for nearly half of the world's smallholder farmers and produce up to 70% of Africa's food. They are largely responsible for agricultural activities, such as growing household crops and vegetables, preserving harvests, and raising livestock. Yet, despite their immense contribution to the sector, women face a number of challenges and barriers, unable to access the land, loans, inputs, and machinery that men do, whilst also carrying the double burden of paid work and unpaid care work looking after their families. Typically receiving less education and owning and accessing fewer assets, women's agricultural activities and productivity remains restricted. At the same time, the industries that exist to support agricultural development are overwhelmingly populated by men in senior and junior roles. So at both ends of the spectrum, we do have a problem. Empowering women and closing the gender gap must be seen as a priority for governments, development organizations, and the private sector across the continent. Not only is it critical for achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goal number five, which is about gender equality and, and empowerment of women and girls, but many others, including eliminating poverty and ending hunger. In Sub-Saharan Africa, agriculture is two to, time, two to four times more effective in reducing poverty than growth in other sectors because when female farmers thrive, everyone benefits, their children, the communities, and the economies to which they contribute. Across Africa, UPL has been leading a number of projects designed to help strengthen women's access to the tools, technologies, markets, training, and credit that they deserve to help them reach their full agricultural potential. This has included leading diversification project with female cocoa growers in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire to help increasing their productivity and provide a second income stream. We have been also fostering female rice producing cooperatives as a part of an integrated rice program in Mali, providing the inputs and tools to boost crop quality and providing an offtake agreement to provide financial security. In Tanzania, as well, we have partnered with Farm Africa to train women on good agricultural practices, enhancing their productivity on sorghum and sunflowers. So we are seeing firsthand the positive impact this is having for female farmers and for their surrounding communities. But we also understand there is a long way to go and a lot more to be done. So Paola and Francesca, thank you for joining us on this very exciting conversation. I want to start by uh, asking you, Paula, before we look at some of your work within UPL, 
I would like to ask you, from your experience, what are the primary challenges facing women in the agribusiness sector? Well, thank you so much, Flo. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, I think you've a kind in your introduction, you've laid out a lot of the challenges that women face uh, in agriculture. And um, this may not be exclusive to agriculture, actually. I think there is clearly is still a gender uh, gap uh, across multiple industries. But when we think about agriculture, women have a very uh, strong role to play. And they've always played a strong role uh, in agriculture from the very beginning when you know traditionally traditionally men would go out and hunt and um, protect the land women would stay uh, closer and um, you know develop the crops and uh, we see today that the productivity of women is even higher than men in agriculture although often with less with fewer resources so generally speaking when we think about um, empowering women, I believe it has to start with giving women opportunities, right? What we see is that when the opportunities are there, uh, women do embrace them and uh, they exceed expectations. You know, thinking about education, allowing women uh, to have access to education, allowing women um, and men uh, in farming to become more resilient uh, from that standpoint, uh, providing the tools that are needed where they need it, and making that um, those available to all uh, uh, farming communities. And we know that uh, there are very many differences be between um, the farming communities that we serve around the world. So the needs may be very different, and we need to adjust to the local needs to be able to address those. It could be through stewardship programs, through making available tools that would not otherwise be available, such as spraying uh, equipment or, or, or even uh, spray, spraying programs for farmers um, and, uh, you know, many other aspects. But um, I really believe it has to be around, um, you know, enhancing uh, resilience for farmers, uh, allowing farmers to grow sustainably their crops and allowing women to have similar opportunities than men. And that's something we're still lacking um, in multiple directions, as we know. So we have to make a concerted effort to actually enhance uh, their, the empowerment of women, their ability to have opportunities in life to do better. And um, as Slohom mentioned as well, I think there is um, there needs to be a very strong recognition as to women, um, you know, doing, uh, you know, two or three jobs, right, in the household, uh, there is always the, the work uh, that is done, let's say, to, to provide for the family, but also the support um, to the family itself, um, taking care of children, uh, taking care of, of the family structure. Um, and that really takes a lot of, a lot of effort, which is often and not fully um, recognized. I think it's um, a bit of a, uh, you know, an honor to be able to have that task, but also we understand how hard it can be depending on the circumstances. And even thinking about the COVID time, um, moving a little bit away from agriculture per se, but, you know, uh, having uh, to, you know, for women to adapt to the realities of working uh, from home, having to support, continue to do their work while having to support the complete infrastructure at home of children. So you, you, we see how complex uh, it is. So making it as simple as it can, as it can be, uh, providing the right level of access to education for women, allowing women to have the same tools or better tools to allow us to actually navigate both on the professional, the farming wor world, and also on our personal lives, right, in a broader sense, I think are, are very important. And, and you know, there, you know, it's a one step at a time that we could make this happen, right, give it women opportunities. Um, there is a nice example, I think you've mentioned quite a few examples that um, we have uh, within UPL in Africa, where we do have a strong um, you know, presence, and it's uh, so great to see so many of these programs. We've also initiated a very 
interesting program in India more recently um, through our um, one of our open ag companies, a Nurture, where we are creating um, a lot of opportunities for women um, to be placed in roles that are uh, possibly traditionally made by men in different farming communities. So allowing women to step away from what is the traditional roles, what, what are the traditional roles that might be available to them and giving the opportunity to do um, something different. And um, it seems like it's, it's really uh, working well and we see the feedback from women or where even the respect within the community is being enhanced by the role that they're uh, able to play. Um, and, you know, it's really one initiative at a time that helps us get there. Um, but resilience for farmers is something that's universal, right, that we all need to continue to, to drive um, with sustainability being at the heart of what we do so we could really have a long term, um, you know, sustainable ability to support uh, food security for, for the world. So those those were some comments that I wanted to make. Thank you so much, Flo. Thank you, thank you so much, you Paola, Paola and, and and we're so uh, glad to have you here to 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 talk to us about this so centrally important topic for the future of agriculture and uh, for UPL uh, as well. So now turning to Francesca, thank you so much for joining us, Francesca. There are some stereotypes about women in farming that are important to deconstruct. Um, Former general director of FAO, Jose Graziano da Silva, once said, evidence shows that when women are empowered, farms are more productive, natural resources are better managed, nutrition is improved, and livelihoods are more secure. Can you tell us how does this quote compare to your experience working across the African continent and to many preconceptions about women working in farming today? Yes, definitely. Uh, Plan, thank you for the question. It's actually, um, you know, very, very true that there are a number of stereotypes when it comes to uh, to rural women, and and I think it is very important to talk about it. So, you know, rural women are engaged in the agriculture sector and really do not represent an homogeneous group. Uh, actually, it is quite the opposite. Indeed, it, it is a very diverse group. Uh, so I cross my my years in the UN system and my work in in Africa and, and Southeast Asia. What I have seen is that I have interacted with many rural women who do have a small plot of land that they farm on. They have a few heads of livestock that they rely on, and you know they use forests to to gather fruits and and hunt wild animals for their livelihoods and survival. So that is uh, you know part of the group of rural women, however, uh, have come across also um, the Botswana woman who's launching, launching a, a tomato business uh, and who's willing to go against the, the big guys in the, in the sector to sell her produce, or uh, the women in Kenya who have pooled their resources and bought cattle and are now engaged in milk value chains, which are now providing meals through the school feeding program. Uh, there are women that, uh, you know, walk miles to go to the borders to uh, sell their produce and they do successfully sell their produce, you know, at, at the border. So cross border women, cross border traders. Um, there are women that have, you know, really gone against the, the, the stereotype in fishing communities and are now, uh, you know, fishing for themselves, for their family, for their livelihoods, which, which is generally uh, seen as, as a man, a man job. Or there are the women in Sri Lanka who, uh, again, you know, pulled together their resources and, and came up with a small tea business, which is now tri thriving. So I could really go on and on and on and on about, um, you know, women and the, the diversity that we see in, in, in this group, in the group of rural women and the women engaged in agriculture. And, um, you know, it really, it really relates and, and can very much link with what uh, Paula just said. She talked about different needs for different women. And, and this is what I'm talking about. There is not one group uh, that we can uh, refer to. Uh, Paula also mentioned that, you know, there are some programs that UPL is carrying out that uh, kind of bring and um, facilitate women in engaging with uh, roles that are outside of um, their gender role. 
uh, and that's very successful. So um, I think it's it's really very important to to kind of look at rural women at this very heterogeneous group, very diverse group with women who have uh, who struggle to survive but also are owners of uh, micro, small, medium enterprises in the agriculture sector. And I mean, in my work in Africa, um, I'm now interacting with a lot of women traders. As you know, you know we've had this year uh, the beginning of the implementation of the Africa free trade area. So this really brings a lot of changes in the environment of the business environment in the agriculture sector and in trade, uh, cross-border trade, inter-regional trade. And of course, you see the big guys interacting in this environment, but there are also a lot of rural women who are thriving in the sector, in the agriculture sector, who are pooling their resources, who are managing to, um, you know, access information and technologies and digitalization, who are upgrading their businesses, who are going from subsistence to commercial farming. Um, so I'm not saying that this is this is why I started my comment by saying that the woman that is struggling has a small plot as a few heads of livestock that is true that is a reality of rural women we see many of them but they're not the only one um and on the other end to go back to your comment about um the comment made by graciano da, jose graciano da silva the former uh, dg fao dg um there is really a direct link that we see over and over and over again between empowerment and economy women empowerment and you know growth and and better nutrition uh, FAO has done a number of studies. We go back to um, many, many studies. There is a flagship report, the 2010-11 State of Food and Agriculture of FAO, that really uh, shed light on the role of women in agriculture. But you know, FAO, like many other agencies in 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 the sector, as well as you know other other actors, um, do talk about the direct benefits that are triggered by women's empowerment at the household level, at the community level. So by empowering women, we do not only bring better nutrition, better income in the household. For example, there is a study, I think it was in 2016 or 17, a study between uh, IFPRI and FAO, 2016 study, that talked about the dimensions of women's empowerment. And we clearly saw that when women are empowered, in the household, there is better nutrition for everybody. Everybody is better nourished. Everybody access school, so kids have higher, better access to education because women tend to reinvest most of their income in the household, improving the household, improving the life of the household members. But this is just the, the, the micro level uh, impact. If we look at a more, a larger, broader picture, when women are empowered, when they have the right tools, the right information, the right resources, natural res resources, productive resources, there is really an effect that triggers economic growth. So women produce more and you know there's less poverty, there's more economic growth, there's more gainings, better gainings for all. So I think that when we look at the work on women's empowerment and, and gender equality, we really have to look at the micro uh, picture, the big picture. Um, by empowering women, we all benefit uh, in one way or another, at the micro level, at the household level. So I think it's really important to have a look at the work on gender equality and really understand how now in, in the new environment, in the new business, including in the situation that was triggered by COVID, by working with women, by leveling the playing field, by, by making sure that we all have uh, the same opportunities, there is really so much more to gain for all of us. I think that's very clear, Francesca. Thank you. If, if I need I... to comment yeah. just, um, you know, to Francesca's uh, comments, I, I really loved, um, you know, the way you, you show the relevance of women, right, in a broader sense and their, their impact, right? So I think that's really, um, you know, fantastic to recognize this influence on communities right the impact of women who are empowered and how they will influence their children they will influence their, their neighbors and and it helps us all you know grow and and do better um as as a society overall so i i think that's incredibly impactful uh and this recognition also that women um have been proving 
that they could do a great job in this space, that they could be as good or better. We see the productivity levels being even higher than men in agriculture. So there is no reason why this shouldn't be the case. And the more we can support women, um, the more positive impact we will have in, in a broader sense. So thank you so much for bringing those examples. Uh, it's really uh, inspiring to, to hear, actually. So Paula, since you're, you're mentioning the role that we should play and, and, and how we can support this dynamic, uh, I was gonna ask Paula, um, uh, sorry, I was gonna ask Francesca, as you've, you've been involved firsthand in the design of uh, policies, public policies for uh, African women empowerment and, and right protection. Um, but the private sector can be actually a great catalyst for the implementation of these policies. So what do you think uh, the private sector should play in terms of, of role for, for women protection and, and empowerment and, and in particular in the agricultural sector? What should be the role of a company like UPL to um, support that dynamic? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, I do. Um, uh, I do think that uh, the private sector has a really big, important role to play. So, like you said, it is correct. Uh, in my experience, I've worked a lot with governments at national level to um, develop new policy frameworks and making policy change. Um, policy making is, is a quite um, lengthy process uh, if you want to do it right. Uh, and in order for that to happen, to to Kind of trigger that policy change to to reform the policy environment there's definitely the element of policy coherence that has to be there but the one key element if you want to come up with a good policy is consultations uh, a good policy sees the inputs and participation of, of pretty much every actor in a sector including the agricultural one um, so in my experience the consultation process takes into account the voice of, of many actors and this definitely includes the private sector. The private sector has, uh, you know, in recent years gained more and more relevance when it comes to, to development efforts. And it is, it is clear why, um, you know, the private sector provides more than half of the overall employment opportunities in the developing world. Uh, this includes formal and informal jobs. It does deliver critical goods and services and, and, and it contributes to tax revenues and flow of capital. So the sector is is definitely more and more uh, encouraged to to leverage the opportunities and mitigate the challenges that, that present themselves in the rural development in the agriculture sector so i think that when it comes to policy development they can be agents of change by speaking about the issues that exist and leveraging the opportunities that their work uh in a country gives them um so you know, when it comes to, to, to an environment like that, by speaking up, they can be really catalysts of change if they engage with the government and trigger transformation. And in my experience, I've seen it really many times. Um, for example, in many countries, the progress that have been made in agriculture mechanization has really frequently been initiated by a push from the private sector, which spoke about the challenges of productivity in the agriculture sector and engaged the government, stimulating a shift that really catalyzed investment and policy change. So the private sector itself um, has a very, very important role to play in the development world, but especially when, I, I mean, my, my background is also a legal background. So I, I really truly believe that the macro level changes do trickle down and create um, changes at many level. Um, so I really believe that by by bringing the private sector in when it comes to the development of new programs or new policies, we have that kind of fresh um, push for innovation, for, you know, I, I mentioned mechanization, but the same has been for digital, digitalization, for transportation and agriculture. Many of the transportation policies that I've seen being implemented throughout the years that I've worked in, in Africa specifically, have been triggered by the input of uh, pub of the of the private sector that wanted to do business in the country and has triggered a change. Um, so I think it's really important to look at the private sector as a good good actor, an important actor that can engage with the government, can um, bring 
people to the table and that has to be brought to the table when we talk about changes in the policy environment and the legal framework. Um, so I think this is one thing that we don't have to forget. And this one, one element that we have to remember when we kind of work at national level, the policies, the, pri the private sector has to be brought in as an ally in a sense. Good point. Thank you, Francesca. Paola, we've looked at the role that the private sector can play in our catalyzing policy. What can you tell us about the work that led up to the launch of the UPL Women Network and what the network sets out to achieve? Oh, thank you so much for, for the question. Um, yes, um, uh, we um, came up with the, the idea of um, launching um, UPL uh, Women's Network because uh, of the recognition that our, uh, we um, are, you know, from a gender standpoint, UPL is very much underrepresented at this point. Uh, we have about, um, when we looked at the initial statistics that drove to this effort, um, you know, overall within UPL, we had a, about 20% representation of women. And of course, when we go to the higher, higher levels of management, it becomes um, even a lower percentage. Um, I don't think this is uncommon in the, um, you know, uh, agrochemical space, as we were discussing before. We've looked at statistics of other companies and uh, often, um, you know, there could be a, a slightly better representation of women, but still certainly underrepresented overall. And, you know, why is it important uh, to enhance gender diversity, right, which is the main driver for the women's network? is really because we truly believe, and, and you know, there, there are so many studies that have indicated that having that um, voice um, and representation really drives a better business performance. And uh, it drives, it allows us to have certain competencies that may be more prevalent in women than there are in men. It allows us to be more creative because there will be new ideas, new ways of working that could come to the company. So we are uh, believing in these elements. Um, and my prior experience uh, as a younger professional in the past, I had um, worked for GE uh, for um, a, a period of time and I truly benefited from the women's network at GE at the time. So I brought the idea to UPL that we should create a women's network within our, our company and it, it received extreme support within the company. And Jay Schroff, who is our CEO, actually is our executive sponsor of the Women's Network. Uh, since the launch um, on March 8th, we already have 350 UPL women uh, that are part of this network. And what are the key objectives of the network? Um, what we want is, of course, to enhance gender diversity within UPL by uh, focusing on two fronts. One is to um, attract external talent, uh, uh, female talent to UPL. And the other is to actually allow us to develop our existing talent within UPL, to have more opportunities um, within our company, to have you know, a, a nice career progression within our company without forgetting that uh, women have to often deal with both a professional and personal lives and having that work-life balance being a critical element as well. So understanding that we need to provide the tools for women to actually be able to succeed uh, professionally as well as personally, um, and ultimately allowing uh, UPL um, to be recognized as a great place to work for women. So uh, we began um, in March of this year. We already had quite a few um, activities going on. Um, and we have a, a specific goal, actually, to enhance um, by 10% our, our representation in the very short term of women in mid and upper management. So we are establishing some concrete goals to increase our gender diversity, but also um, to, to uh, reach out to women and start giving them tools to be successful internally and also from a recruiting um, standpoint, providing a concerted effort to enhance um, 
you know, the, the, the representation of women within UPL. And I'll just give a few examples of that. Um, in terms of our internal programs, uh, we started with, um, you know, just sharing uh, with women, um, you know, major competencies that are normally uh, more um, importantly found within um, women that are critical for business. So we started, um, you know, really trying to embrace the concept that we should all actually not try to act as men in the workplace, but actually um, value some of the capabilities that women could bring to the mark to the to 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 the workplace and actually help our business through those capabilities and competencies actually perform better. Some examples that are very um, well known is like um, women tend to have more empathy or work well in groups or, you know, there are multiple aspects, right, that we want to be able to leverage and create a more diverse work, workplace in terms of our thinking. And, you know, the idea of embracing those female competencies instead of trying to um, reproduce, let's say, or to operate, you know, simulating what men do. Uh, and actually giving the challenge even to men to embrace some of these core competencies that are good for business. Um, we are also working hard um, in terms of, you know, creating a network where there could be a lot of dialogue between women. Uh, we are working on a mentoring program for um, women within UPL. Uh, we are looking at certain policies in terms of, um, you know, things that we could do internally. Francesca was talking about policies from an external viewpoint, but what are some of the things we could do internally to allow women uh, to be successful in, in the workplace? Um, some few examples, like in Brazil, we've um, extended uh, the period of maternity leave or allowing women to actually not have to travel if they've just had a child for two years to be able to stay home with the children. Little things sometimes that have a huge impact in, in women's ability to be successful both in the workplace and also at home. Um, we've also, uh, you know, we're now creating a Women Inspiring Women event where we are going to be um, portraying 14 women within UPL with different characteristics, different capabilities, different uh, areas of focus, and having a panels and a dialogue uh, so that women could ask questions um, around that. I mentioned the uh, mentoring program. So there are multiple things that are happening here. And more importantly is uh, we've really been able to enhance um, um, you know, the interest and the visibility of uh, this important topic um, within UPL with all the leadership really embracing it. And on an external front, uh, we're really um, working, for instance, to um, hire women uh, in certain areas where we are truly underrepresented. For instance, having more women in commercial roles within UPL or more women in operations roles. So specific programs to drive um, an enhancement of our participation in some of these areas of focus. So I hope this gives you a broad level perspective of the Women's Network. We're very excited about the engagement and um, really uh, just getting to know the amazing women that we have within UPL and uh, being able to hopefully multiply that um, in, the, uh, in the months and years to come. So thank you. Thank you, Paola. Thank, thank you so much for, for sharing with us some of the short and long-term objectives of these uh, fantastic initiatives with uh, the UPL uh, Women Network. So uh, kudos to you and, and more Greece. And we, we, we are ready to join uh, the network and, and embrace the core values of women. <laughs> Speak for the men. Huh? Um, fantastic. Yes, we're very diverse. We accept men as well. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Now, now, going back to Francesca with maybe a, a last example, um, we often talk about best practices and uh, showing by doing. Uh, Francesca, to your opinion, what are the most successful programs you have seen that set out to enfranchise women in agriculture on the field? Any concrete examples you have in mind to conclude? 
Yeah, absolutely. Too many, I would say. But um, if I had to pinpoint one example when that uh, comes to mind when we talk about empowering women in agriculture, I think that we have to look at the bigger, at the big challenges. Um, and I, I think that one of the very big challenges for women in agriculture is access to resources. And I'm talking particularly about access to land, which is such an important and fundamental resources, resource to have. So we, we see over and over again that land represents the most one of the most important resources and 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 which women struggle to uh to have um you know and and this is not only a, a resource that is needed to farm uh it's also a resource that is needed to expand their businesses as as without land and assets and therefore a collateral there's no uh, access to financial services and credit to to engage in the sector or expand any uh, business in the agriculture sector so uh, one program that comes to mind is, is a program that FAO implemented in Mozambique um, and is a program that focuses on training paralegals. Uh, in Mozambique, land law provides a, a statutory recognition of customary land rights, and it really is considered one of the most progressive legislations in Africa. However, uh, there are challenges in implementation, and, and this is always uh, the case. Um, Indeed, really having simply having a new law does not mean necessarily that a, a transformation is going to happen or change is going to happen. So uh, the FAO built a program that supported the implementation of this law through capacity development, targeted at you know various groups uh, who are either beneficiaries of the law, so rural communities, rural women, or those responsible for implementing it. So it's training uh, women or training those who the duty bearers those, those who access the law is just as important as training those who are actually responsible for the implementation of the law so really FAO supported the development of a new capacity development to empower rural communities on on the one side as well as local government so the true focus of the training was was to further understanding on uh of how to use national laws for more equitable development. So this starts with, with recognizing the rights of rural communities before moving into the discussion on how to use the various um, legal and, and practical instrument to really promote investment at the very end. So this is really just one example that comes to mind. Um, one of many that I could uh, bring up, how truly carries out a variety of programs that the benefit women in the agriculture sector. Um, we, we do have programs, in, important programs for employment generation, access to inputs, technologies, the reduction of work burden, which is something that Paula mentioned before, that the, you know, the double burden of women in their productive and reproductive role powers a number of programs that really foster reduction of, of work burden in the agriculture sector, so labor saving technologies, for example. But you know, nevertheless, facilitating access to natural resources and, and particularly land, in my opinion, remind, remains one of the most important actions that we can make to truly empower women and give them an opportunity to excel in the system, which is something that they are perfectly capable of doing when they have access to the same resources, assets, and opportunities than the men do. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, on, on that note, I want to, to thank you both, uh, actually, Francesca and Paola, for uh, joining us today on this UPL Insight episode and for sharing with us such a range of compelling and persuasive stories from your respective careers. To find out more about the work UPL is leading, you can visit our website or follow the full UPL Insight series on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Music. Thank you for watching and see you on the next one.